Thank you. Thank you, Andrea, and we're delighted to welcome Tim Hartley, who's Chancellor of the St. Emilio Girard for the North of England. And the main uh, emphasis of this talk is going to be the St. Emilio classification system, which was updated last year amid uh, considerable controversy. And in addition to this, Tim will also be discussing the ever increasing land prices and the effect of these on what has always been an essentially family-based uh, wine area. So I'd like to give a big welcome to Tim and thank you very much for being with us today. And over to you, thank you. Um, I'll just make a note about wine prices because actually I've got a fair number of notes on the classification, but I'll do that uh, towards the end, the wine prices, if I may, because they do tie in, in a sense, to the classification pressures, I think. Perfect, thank you. Um, uh, everybody knows, of course, in this group that the right bank missed out on the 1855 classification entirely. Uh, but that doesn't necessarily mean that Saint Emilion has not been concerned with quality. Uh, it has. Um, and indeed, uh, just as a historical introduction in the first place, it may be interesting to look back at its, at its history. Um, as you know, the Girard governed saint emilion from the late 12th century right up to 1792, and they were very concerned with quality. Uh, they had a fairly crude system whereby the Jura would taste from each barrel, and the barrels that were good uh, were uh, accepted uh, and stamped with the seal of the Girard. Um, I will uh, just uh, show you a reconstruction of that, just as a matter of interest, matter of fun, a reconstruction of that uh, a couple, three or four years ago, when they uh, brought some barrels into the square with the Girard present uh, and did the ceremonial tasting and then sealed the barrel with the seal of the, uh, of the Girard which was done throughout the Middle Ages uh, and right up to the revolution. So it isn't a new thing that Santa Minos concerned with, been concerned with quality. Indeed, if, those if the barrel didn't merit the seal, in those days it got broken up and the wine drained off. And some of us who've been brought uh, Odd bottles of Saint Emilion, or what's alleged to be Saint Emilion from a supermarket or on occasion, may have wished that those barrels had suffered the same fate if they'd ever been in Saint Emilion in the first place. But uh, that's perhaps uh, by the by, it's great fun uh, to see that sort of reconstruction. Uh, but it does reflect that history still plays really quite an important part in the classification because. Uh, the classification is made, I think, much more difficult. Any classification system is made much more difficult in saint Emilion by reason of its historical roots and its history. The very fact that the boundaries of the two appellations are synonymous with, with late 13th century uh, boundaries, the boundaries of the jurisdiction of saint Emilion set by Edward II in 1292, are still the boundaries of the Appalachian today. So the very fact that those boundaries were military boundaries, political boundaries in those days, mean that unlike, I think, just about any other Appalachian in France, saint uh boundaries have little or nothing to do with the uh, wine which is grown within those boundaries. Now that presents a massive problem uh, for anybody classifying because it means that typicity for the whole area is very difficult uh, to, to establish. <clears throat> the, uh, the boundaries have nothing to do with wine at all. And if one looks at the, uh, just as a quick reminder, if one goes back and looks at the, uh, um, uh, at saint Emilion itself, uh, and I'm sure it's familiar with everybody, familiar to everybody, but I will just uh, go back to it and, uh, 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 and show the map of the jurisdiction of Saint-Emilion, which is uh, 
bounded in red there. Originally, it was only this little area around Santa Minia, which they say in 1292 was extended to the other, the other communes of the, or the other parishes that they then were uh, of uh, what is still the jurisdiction. Uh, and you'll be familiar with the fact that the land down here, below the comb that one sees curling around in the middle of the map here, the land down here is all uh, really new sands, largely new sands, I should say. It's, it all is, is far too big a generalization uh, and is a totally different uh, composition as a matter of generality from the land of the plateau up here or, or the land up here next to Pomerol, uh, where we have Cheval Blanc and Fijac, where there are the big gravels. So you have a uh, a disparity of terroir in Saint-Emilion, which uh, is enormous. I think the geologists used to argue about whether there were 18 or 22 different soil types. Uh, in uh, now, uh, as techniques for discovery have got better, they have, uh, they're arguing, I think, about whether there are 27 or 32 at the last count I heard. Somebody may have heard a more recent count than that. Uh, 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 and this poses real problems for any classification system. Uh, here you have uh, on the screen at the moment, a quilt, which was done by Granny at Chateau Trimoulet, when they did some ground invest, groundwork investigations. That is a chateau where I think they've got 17 or 18 hectares under vines. No more than that, certainly. Yet they have 13 different soil types within that uh, small area. So you have a problem of typicity, which for which I am sorry for anybody trying to trying to sort out a classification system in saint -Emilion. And I mentioned this at the outset because it's something I think that's often overlooked when people are discussing saint -Emilion's classification system and its problems. Uh, and in some ways, it's at the heart of some of the criteria which have been adopted, or maybe the reason for some of the criteria which have been adopted um, and which have been criticized in the past. Um, but the reality is that uh, from about the Second World War, saint Emilion began to think it needed a classification system uh, as perhaps it moved more into the world market than it had been. It had always exported to Belgium very heavily but we had looked very much to the left bank rather than the right historically and traditionally, I think. Uh, and uh, of course, international markets were developing after the war. And I think the saint millionaire felt that they needed a classification system. One of the other reasons may be that people were using all sorts of odd terms uh, for their wines. Um, we I will show you, uh, here a moment, uh, a bottle of a 1947 Beaux Jour Becco, I'm sorry, Ballastel Latonel this is, the Beaux Jour doesn't have this seal on, which shows the first use of the Girard seal since I think 1792, because the Girard was reformed in 1948. Uh, and uh, so this would have been bottled in 1949 and would have been the first vintage at which the Girard's, on which the Girard seal could be used. Uh, I don't know whether it was authorized or not. It's described as a label de control, you see on there, but uh, I haven't been able to discover what the system was then. But perhaps of more interest to classification and the need for classification is the label that bottle bears, which you will see describes the bottle as Grand Premier Cru. That had no basis, uh, as I understand it, in either law or, or, or any authorization whatsoever. 
that Girard had certainly not started using those sort of terms and hadn't authorized them upon their refounding. So it, it, you were getting wines that were being described in terms that really had no lawful basis. Although, of course, uh, for those of us who like Bellas de la Tonnelle, we would all agree that it is probably a Grand Premier Cru, but uh, it, it, it uh, still is better if it is an authorised use. Uh, I, I, perhaps I speak as a lawyer, but I also speak as a wine lover uh, when I say that I think it, if you're going to describe something in, in particular terms, you do need some basis for it. Um, uh, and so you had, uh, by, the, by that time, real pressure for a classification system. And the obvious problem was the one I've already mentioned of typicity. But they managed to avoid that simply by a system which gave emphasis to quality of wine uh, and which was determined not to avoid the 1855 problems. First of all, in, in two respects. First of all, it, it, in its inflexibility, because of course, apart from uh, Mouton, as we know, the 1855 classifications hardly moved, if at all, since then. Uh, and the second was that they described wines as first first, second, third, fourth, fifth growths. Uh, and I think a lot of the growers in Saint-Emilion, while they quite wanted to be classified, didn't want to be a fourth or fifth growth, which you can understand. Uh, or, although it does mark some of the third and fourth growths as we know are wonderful. Um, it, it perhaps, for those who don't know uh, and don't know the history, does now tend to suggest something that is less good than some of them are. So they decided on a system which would have more flexibility in it and a system in which you only divided into the two classes, Premier Grand Cru Classe itself subdivided into A and B uh, and Grand Cru Classe. A and they decided that in order to qualify for either classification, you had to have been Grand Cru who had to have produced a Grand Cru wine in seven out of the 10 preceding years. A and then the wines had to be subject to blind tasting with up to seven of those wines being subject to that tasting. That system seemed to work reasonably well, but there were always suspicions around that because those doing the tasting was largely uh, from the Bordeaux wine market, uh, were largely negotiant. If you weren't selling your wine by that means, there was a suspicion that you would uh, not be favored when it came to the classification system. A and people gradually decided that they wanted, uh, or some people decided that a change of the system was a good idea. In fact, up to the change uh, until about 2006, things went fairly well and there was little, uh, little problem. Uh, indeed, uh, we see that uh, wines were promoted and demoted quite regularly uh, over the time. Uh, the numbers are quite interesting. There we have uh, the First year, 1955, a list was produced in draft. It was finally, I think, promulgated and approved by the state in 58. Uh, and we see that there, there were two A's, Ozone and Cheval Blanc. Then we have uh, 10 B's and 63 Grand Cru classes. Uh, and in the following classification, there was an addition of nine more Grand Cru classes. But then in 1986, of course, uh, that was the year in which Mich Michel Becco, or that was the classification after Michel Becco, had brought La Carte in, into Beaujolais Becco. And so he was demoted. Because the other area in which Saint-Emilion had decided it was going to differ 
the other principal area had decided it was going to differ from a, from the Medoc classification was uh, in ensuring that the classification was tied to the terroir and not to the name of the chateau or the owner. So in Saint Emilion, it was forbidden to take in, and still is, to take in without approval land, even neighbouring land as La Carte was, uh, and bring it into the classified wine. La Carte, in fact, I mean, was Michel Becker was absolutely right, in my humble opinion, to say that La Carte was as good as Bourgeois, the, the wine at uh, the principal chateau. They were neighbor, they were neighbors, the terroir was very similar. And I've drunk both 1947 La Carte and Beausjour, and 1949 La Carte and Beausjour, and 76 of both uh, on the same occasion. And it was difficult to see made as they were by the same person, people under the same conditions, difficult to see that there was any great distinction between them. Nonetheless, Beauchesur Becker was demoted from Brumaire Grand Cru Classé in that year, uh, but uh, without uh, litigation. He hadn't got a leg to stand on as the reality. He'd know he'd broken the rules and he accepted that he had. Of course, by 1996, everybody had recognized that in wine terms, if not in terms of the rules, he'd been right. And Bertrand Becker came back into the classification in that year. Uh, but you will see that in that year as well, uh, seven other chateaux, no, eight chateaux uh, dropped out uh, of the classification, were demoted. Uh, and that was done without real fuss at the time. Most of the owners who, who were demoted seemed to recognize that there was some merit uh, in the decision. Indeed, uh, some of those who came afterwards would go further and say that it was very well deserved, including, for instance, Francois d'Espagne at Corbin d'Espagne, who has always said that until he wasn't running it then, but uh, really the wines being produced in that period were not worthy of the chateau. Uh, it wasn't really until 2006 that the problems arose, when you will see there was a very marked uh, demotion. Uh, two were promoted, two chateaux were promoted to uh, Premier Grand Cru Classé, but that still left at seven chateau that had been demoted, uh, 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 and that caused something of a rumpus, especially because several of those chateau were in fact uh, ones that had been bought in the, inter in the intervening 10 years by somebody new who had gone on to change winemaking, to invest heavily, on the basis that they bought a Grand Cru Classé Chateau uh, and were going to be improving the wine. And at least in some of the cases of those who complained, I think it's fair to say that they had good cause to say, well, actually, the wine of this last four years, three, four years, however long they'd been there, is much better than the first period at which you're looking at it. But the rules were the rules. Uh, they'd gone into the system on that basis, those who defend the system would say, uh, 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 and they should have accepted that the tasters were going to be tasting throughout the range of, of, of the years and not just the wines they themselves had made. But for Chateau uh, went to court over it, they won at first instance, they lost on the first appeal, and won on the second appeal, with the result that the whole classification was suspended. Well, it being suspended, the old one had lapsed. It left no classification in place at all. Uh, that was 2009. It took another three years for the government to, uh, another two years, I'm sorry, for the government to get round to uh, 
not just to reinvent, reimposing or re reviving, I suppose is the best word, the 1996 classification, but also adding to it those who would have been promoted in 2006, but had missed out because of the suspension of the, of the system. The result was that uh, people thought, well, actually this isn't working very well. And INAO stepped in, the, 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 the French government's wine controlling body stepped in uh, and new rules were drawn up. Those rules had in themselves, some would say, uh, inherent problems. First of all, the tasting was to be done by a nominated panel from outside Bordeaux to avoid conflicts of interest. Now that, to a lawyer sounds wonderful, to a wine lover who, and any wine lover who knows France reasonably well, uh, means you may have problems. And in 2012, you had people from the Rhone and Burgundy tasting saint emilions for the classification system. Now, there were those who said that if you're going to have people from outside Bordeaux tasting, then what you need are internationally reputable palates, palates that people across the world recognize as having the knowledge, experience, and ability to judge the wines of Bordeaux. That would have meant, of course, a fair number of Anglo-Saxon commentators being brought in. Those of us who know France reasonably well were not hopeful that that would, that would ever happen. Uh, but there were many who thought it was the right approach rather than having people who are distinguished winemakers in their own fields coming in and tasting saint emilions with which they were probably wholly unfamiliar. They might have tasted, had drunk them from time to time, but as we all know, the France is quite insular. The French wine regions are quite insular. You don't often get offered a bottle of something else in one region by a grower, uh, even on a ceremonial occasion or a special occasion. You may get champagne, but I don't think I've ever been offered uh, Chablis or Alsace or Burgundy in, in the houses I've been entertained in in saint Emilio, and I would be surprised if they were often drunk there. And I think the same is probably true in the other regions as well. So uh, that was one of the main problems of the class, of, I think, of the 2012 system as it was perceived to be. Uh, the other issue that, were, that arose was the way the, the marks were allocated, which for Grand Cru Classé gave 50% of the marks for tasting, 20% for international reputation, promotional activities, wine tourism, accessibility and distribution, 20% for terroir and 10% for viticultural techniques, traceability and aging capacity. There was a number of people who questioned what some of those considerations had to do with the quality of wine. And it is fair to say, for instance, that Chateau like Corbin Michot, which was demoted, had nobody employed to take visitors round uh, to, uh, or, 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 or to conduct tastings. You would be, you would have the, uh, one of the family who was involved in the wine growing and wine making to receive you uh, and to take you through their wines, the making and the tasting. Now, there are those who would say, what could be better? But 
it appears that you got more marks in the classification system if you employed a student or, or somebody else to tell you what the wine was about from a pre from a pre drawn script uh, 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 and uh, who mightn't be able to answer any of the intelligent questions that a group like mine, for instance, would ask. And I must say, I, if I go to a chateau, I infinitely prefer to meet the grower. And if I take my group to a chateau, I infinitely prefer that their difficult questions are answered by the owner or, or, or the grower or the maître de chez or whoever it may be who's, who's, who knows his stuff. I would not like to suffer the fate that some of the groups uh, at the Union de Producteurs suffered when my son went to work there uh, over the summer as, a, as an undergraduate uh, and uh, found himself taking groups round on his first day. So there were elements of the classification system which were the subject of, of, of some informed criticism. Uh, and those matters, which have been described as the Disney factor, uh, have added to the concern that was expressed about the, the marks that were attributed to tasting and taste. Uh, it's fair to say, of course, and, and this is the, the defense that is often given, that to the marks for tasting have to be added to some extent, some of the marks for international reputation. But since that cover the 20% for, which included that, included a lot of other things as well, the marks for international reputation were not all that high. 20% for terroir uh, is a, a subjective thing in Saint-Emilion because, of course, more recently, some of the, the wines promoted have come from terroir that was far from being classically good. But, um, uh, and those who criticise say that what they would like to see is that being much more a mark for truth to terroir, for the wine actually reflecting the terroir on which it is grown, which is, as I've already pointed out, very disparate in Saint-Emilion, uh, but would like to see that rather than the marks given for terroir in an abstract sense. But that's uh, perhaps a, an equally difficult test. The, bulk of the criticism here is that most, most of those who criticise say they would like to see 75-80% of the marks going for, for tasting and the tasters appropriately qualified to do the tasting. The Premier Grand Cru Classé criteria, orig as originally drawn in 2000, for 2012, only provided 30% of the marks for tasting 35% for international reputation, promotional activities, wine tourism, accessibility and distribution. And there are those who would say that the high, uh, the high percentage of promotional activities and wine tourism has led to uh, the increase in, uh, in building that we've seen at the Premier Grand Cru Classé level in saint Emilion. Uh, I'm not going to enter into an architectural debate, I'm not qualified, uh, uh, but there are those who, who like and those who dislike uh, some of the things that have been built. All I would say is that those of us who've seen Fijak Shea, for instance, and have seen the plans for Berger or Becker, uh, would say that some of it is very tasteful and very well done. Um, but 30% for tasting at Premier Grand Cru Classé level was again criticised um, because it was pointed out that if the majority of the marks went elsewhere, um, other factors became more important. The counter to that, of course, was that you had to pass for Grand Cru Classé before you could be considered for Premier Grand Cru Classé. So you'd already acquired marks for tasting for the Grand Cru Classé level 
enough to get through that level. Those who criticized said, but yes, but at this level, tasting ought to be even more important and capacity to age ought certainly to be more than, uh, more than the, uh, the 5% that it was given uh, uh, along with uh, uh, viticultural techniques and traceability. So in a sense, the 2012 system had within it, I think it is fair to say, some of the roots of its own recent problems. And they are matters that have been picked up, of course, by those chateaux uh, that have uh, caused, well, not caused, but have been uh, part of the recent problems. Even though for 2022, the tasting mark was raised to 50% and the mark for terroir was reduced from 30 to 10 it, for Premier Grand Cru Classé, it still left tasting as a relatively poor relation. And that is something which, of course, Ozone and Cheval Blanc picked up when in January 21, they announced that they were no longer going to take part in the classification system. They were then the oldest Premier Grand Cru Classé A Chateau, had been in two, until 2012 the only Premier Grand Cru Classé Chateau, and had been under a, a, a Premier Grand Cru Classé under all the system, A, under all the systems. They had uh, many thought that they ought to have been joined by Fijac in 2012, uh, 2006, but notoriously Fijac was not promoted because it wasn't selling at a high enough price. A weakness of the old system, which can still occur under the new, because of course it goes with international reputation. Price is included under that heading. So we have uh, Cheval Blanc and Ozone in July, sorry, did I say January? It was July 21, deciding they were no longer going to take part. And they cited in particular, uh, the, as reasons for coming out of the system, they cited in particular, um, sorry, I'm still sharing, I probably oughtn't to be, um, cited as reasons for coming out of the system, the problems uh, of, Posed by the classification. They took the view that, uh, um, I better quote accurately, I think, but they uh, took the view that, um, sorry, I've just lost my notes. Would you forgive me for a moment? Here we are. Uh, They took the view that, uh, that, that the classification system itself was really one which had departed from its links to terroir, capacity to age, and quality of wine. So they were, in a sense, echoing the criticisms which had been made of the proposals when they were in draft and when they were first promulgated in 2012. They went into the classification in 2012 and of course came through it with flying colors. And there's little doubt that they would have come through it as well in 2022. It's difficult to see that they would not have done, but they've had little faith in it and they withdrew and that of course was a blow to the system because those two long-standing stars in the classifications firmament had always shone at its brightest true they were joined by pavian angelus in 2012 
I don't personally believe that that contributed to the withdrawal of Ozone and Cheval Blanc, although there are others who say that it did because the style of Pavian Angelus was perhaps somewhat different from the style of Cheval Blanc and Eugène, but they did feel that it no longer represented what they wanted the classification system to represent. And that was, I think, a great shame. I don't know if it is going to provoke a change and a rethink. Certainly the criticisms of the marking of A did produce a quiet rethink between 2012 and, and 2000, uh, Premier Grand did produce a rethink between 2012 and 2022 in that the marks for tasting went up, but uh, it, it, it's not sure, it's not certain what would have happened if they had stayed in and made their criticisms within the system. Equally, having pulled out and made them outside it, it's impossible to tell what will happen. There are many who hope that it will provoke a rethink on the, on the marking for the quality of wine. Terroir is difficult, uh, as we've already said, because of the so many different terroir all producing, or many of which, many different terroir producing good wine. But more fundamental, I think, in one sense, and more worrying in one sense, was La Gaffelière's withdrawal from the system. Because they withdrew after they had got the preliminary marks from their tasters. Uh, and they said that the tasting marks, which none of us know what they were because they saw them in draft, the tasting marks in no way reflected the criticism of those or the comments and approbation of those who had tasted, whose palates they respected uh, and uh, which were well known internationally. And in fact, if one looks at the, the writers in, in, in English and French on, on Saint-Emilion, people like Stephen Brooke, people like Jane Anson, uh, you find that there is a common theme that La Gaffelier's wines have improved in the last few years rather than the reverse. And yet those marks did not reflect that. And it was at the same time that it was revealed that there had been an advertisement in the Bordeaux wine press for people to come and to, to apply to taste for the classification system. Now, that was done in the interests, I am quite sure, when the Wine Council says that was done in the interests of transparency they are absolutely right that it was meant to be a way of ensuring that people had faith in the system. Unfortunately, it can be interpreted in two ways. Uh, and many of the critics of the system have interpreted it as meaning that the system was not looking to appoint well-known and reputable tasters was looking round for tasters. I don't believe that to be the case. I don't know who made up the tasting panel this time. It is said to have been more Bordeaux centred, again as a response I think to the criticism of what happened in 2012. But this is something where again those who think a classification system is a good thing on the whole for saint Emilion, and I'm among those, uh, many of those who, who are concerned about what has happened recently I would say that you do need to be looking, first of all, at the number of marks given for tasting, and secondly, at the quality of the tasters with a view to naming reputable and reputed tasters 
who we can uh, rely upon to know their wines in this area. So it's a, it's a difficult area uh, really for, for Saint Emilion this is, but any human system of classification is bound to have its detractors, bound to have its problems. But uh, we do need to get back, I think, to a system that inspires more, more common respect and common uh, approbation and from which great names will not pull out because otherwise we are going to have uh, an increasing question mark over classification itself. And I don't think there's any doubt that the classification has overall made people strive harder uh, uh, and has given people a target at which to aim uh, at the better end of the chateau. Of course, there are many who, who do not wish to participate in the system at all. And some of them make some very good wines uh, and have some very good terroir. Chateau Coutet, for instance, which is surrounded by Grand Men, the Beausjours, Bellevue, has never played a part in the classification system. It sells its wines at the same sort of price as Grand Cru Tassé wines. Uh, 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 and uh, it has no desire to enter into the trouble and expense of putting its name forward for classification. Uh, they are not alone in that. There's a number of others like it. Like Ophelia has now joined that number. I hope though that not many more will. Um, Angelus I haven't mentioned because Angelus is also pulled out of the classification system. Um, but that was for rather different reasons, because uh, Hubert de Boer was, as you know, accused of um, conflict of interest and found by a French court to have a conflict of interest, a, a decision which he decided not to appeal because he didn't wish the controversy to go on and on and on forever it having gone on long enough already, he felt, between 2012 and 2021, when the French court finally ruled on the subject, uh, Angelus withdrew, uh, and they said that they'd withdrawn because the classification system had become, in their own words, a vehicle for antagonism and instability. That is a sad comment uh, from a chateau where the premier jura uh, is very much involved in running it. I know Stephanie now is, is really taking over from her father, but uh, nobody can say Dubert de Boer is not still involved with Angelus. And so it is rather sad that, um, that we've got to that point. I hope that will provoke a, provoke a rethink to consider some of the questions which I've raised this afternoon or which have been raised by others and which I've mentioned this afternoon. Uh, it, it, it is fair to say that Saint-Emilion is changing its nature. It's becoming more commercial in, in some ways, driven by a massive increase in wine prices, driven by in land prices, uh, which cannot possibly uh, reflect the value of the wine which is sold in many of them. Uh, they have become, it has become a place where I'm afraid insurance companies are replacing families far too often, which is sad because when I first went in 1993, Saint-Emilion was very much family oriented. The average size of the vineyards was between four and five hectares. It's now, by reason of merger, gone up to about eight hectares. There were then about 850 growers. We're now down to about 650. Uh, and there have been, as you know, a number of mergers with Canon buying Matras uh, and buying Berlique. Uh, Berlique still being run as, uh, as a separate Chateau at the moment, while Matras is being used, I think, for Canon's second wine. Uh, 
elsewhere, of course, there have been other changes. Likewise, Grand Ponte, sadly, has now become part of the Cantus Empire, uh, as has La Rosée. And so you're getting an amalgamation of interests and of vineyards, which is favoring those with big pockets at the expense of the families who are already very worried by how they can pass on their estates to their children. And of course, as wine prices rise, as they're driven up by outside investors, uh, the problem becomes enormous for passing uh, the estates on. As you know, it's a twofold one in France. First of all, there's no relief on agricultural land from inheritance tax as there is in the UK. Uh, uh, and secondly, uh, of course, it's impossible to nominate one child uh, who's the most interested to take over uh, and to inherit the place because the French uh, Napoleonic code requires uh, the distribution of, the, of, of a parent's assets between the children. You can't leave your assets either by primogeniture as here is sometimes still done or, or uh, to the child who's most interested uh, as could have been. And we've seen a number of chateaux in Santa Minia Sutta notoriously, which was run by uh, Francois de Dignes for many, many years while his parents were ill, uh, to the great benefit of his sister, his sisters, but when parents died, his sisters were, or, or their, his siblings wanted uh, their money out of the estate. They had an equal share in it and the estate was sold uh, to an insurance company. Um, and that is, I'm afraid, something that is happening all too often. And one of the really worrying things about increasing land prices in Saint Emilio is that that will go on happening. Uh, and we shall end up with a, a pattern of holdings which is much more like the left bank, where bigger growers, bigger owners predominate, and where the wonderfully friendly, welcoming Saint Emilio families are driven off the land. Uh, it, it, by, by a combination of wine prices, of land prices uh, and the, the Napoleonic Code. And that is something that uh, I think we'd all regret. Um, I don't know if I've covered what you hoped I'd cover, but uh, I'm happy to answer questions or to, to deal with uh, anything you think I've missed if I can, <laughs> in a question and answer session. Thank you very much, Tim. Um, a superb uh, presentation and background to the classification system for us all. Uh, Keith Granger has got a question. Can I just hand over to you, Keith? Uh, sure. <laughs> Thanks, Tim. It really was a very informative, excellent presentation. I learned a great deal. But I think the classification really has had its heart taken away with the draw with the withdrawal of its elite chateau. And I liken it to the Premier League without having Manchester City, Manchester United, Arsenal and Spurs. Um, I personally think it'd be preferable now to abandon the whole thing. Pomerol manages perfectly well, indeed he's on a high without a classification. And at the end of the day, it is the market and the critics and the writers who perhaps rule over reputations. I, I take your point that there are essential differences there between saint Emilion and Pomerol. The first is size. Pomerol has so few chateaux, it's easy for everybody to know uh, most of them, if not all of them. It's very different in saint Emilion, And the differences between the very best saint Emilions and the less good ones are still, even now, quite marked. And I think the classification system does two things. It allows those, only those with a certain amount of money, it's fair to say, but those with a certain amount of money to know that when they buy a bottle of a classified wine, they're getting 
something that's worth drinking. Because I don't think there are many wines that have been classified that are not good. You can debate their relative excellence of, of some of them. And you can say, as I said in after 2012 about Corbin Michot, that it should never have been declassified. Uh, I mean, that was, that was a, a fundamental failing of the system in the same year as uh, it had beaten Canon La Gefelière in the Coupe des Grands Cru Classé. Corbin Michot was demoted and Canon La Gefelière was promoted to Premier Grand Cru Classé. And the judgment in the Coupe des Grands Cru, de Grand Cru Classé is by its peers, blind. So that, I'm not saying class, the classification systems, you won't have got the impression, I think they're always infallible. Or, 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 but I do think that in saint Emilion, they have given something at which people at the top end can, if they, of the Grand Cru system, can, if they wish, aim for. And I think it has raised the general level and standard, probably, from that point of view. And it does allow, as I say, purchasers to know what they're getting. Though it's fair to say I have often seen on French wine lists outside the area a Grand Cru Classé or even a Premier Grand Cru Classé listed just as Grand Cru because somebody hasn't, uh, hasn't looked beyond the Appellation to the classification. But um, I, I take your point about Pomerol, but, but I do still think that, that saint Emilio is just too big for the same rule to apply necessarily or for people to know. I mean, I have difficulty remembering the all the, I don't think I could recite all the Grand Cru Classé by, by heart. Uh, and some of, them I, some of them I like better than others, it's fair to say. Some of them I think are better than others. Some of them aren't my style of wine. But I do think that they, they provide a, a band of, of quality at which others can aim and which help potential buyers at that level. And if others below that level are aiming at that level and improving their game as well, it's also helping those below. So I think that that would be my answer. I don't think the classification system is spent in saint Emilion. I just think it needs tweaking uh, in, in order to bring, bring, the, bring uh, Manchester City, uh, Manchester United, Arsenal and Spurs back in. <laughs> Thank you, Tim. Thank you. Uh, Trevor Sherrott's got a question, and also yeah. after that, I think Dominic had a, had a question. He had his hand up. So over to you first, Trevor. Yes, thank you. Thanks, Tim. Very, very interesting. Um, I, I, I'm sure we all have lots of views about the criteria they used and the results that came out and who should be judges. But fundamentally, I, my main problem is the, um, the legal contests in challenges in 2006, the the legislative challenges in 2012, perhaps there are many others. Um, I think it does the um, appellation harm uh, when it goes about these matters and then starts arguing amongst itself. I couldn't, um, couldn't and I think that's more, more harmful than, you know, whether it should be 20% on terror or whatever, the discussions about those things. Why is it not possible for them to come together and agree that they will agree on whatever comes out and to set the rules that they are happy with to take that decision. That is, it reminds me of Brexit, you know, everyone blames the system because it didn't produce the right result. They should be able to agree a system and then bind themselves to it, surely. I couldn't agree more. And in the past that tended to happen uh, is the reality. I mean, for instance, I think for instance, Fijak, and grand men would both have had a perfectly good legal challenge on competition grounds in 2006, when they both got a letter saying, <laughs> le seul motif, the only reason for not being promoted in one case to Premier Grand Cru Classé and the other in Fijak's case to A, uh, was that they weren't selling at the same price as those already in that category. I mean, not only is that a logical nonsense, it strikes me that it was anti-competitive. 
because as I think uh, either Stephen Brook or, Jan, or Jane Anson, I can't remember which it is, comments, it, 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 it was a disincentive to moderation of price. It was certainly not something as a consumer that I welcomed. <laughs> Uh, and I don't suppose anybody else did either. But Thierry Manoncourt, having been Premier Jura, was far too dignified, far too civilised, and thought far too much of saint Emilio as a whole to launch proceedings, although he was upset. I mean, he, I was there not long after he got the, there too after he got the letter and he showed me the letter. And I said to him, you know, do you mind if I quote it? And he said, no, not at all. Uh, which is why I am to. But uh, I mean, I know that that was the only reason they were not promoted to A. Uh, and many people in his shoes would have litigated, but he took the very sensible and civilized view that you've expressed. And I, t I wish too that others, after all, if you play a game, you should play it by its rules. And all right, you may not like the umpire's decision or the referee's decision at any point, but uh, you really are stuck with it. But I'm afraid we live in an increasingly litigious age. And the only people in recent years who've really benefited financially from the, uh, from the, the, the classification are, are my French brethren at the bar, I fear. Uh, 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 and uh, that's a sad, that's a very sad thing. I agree with you. I think it's a great shame that they that they do not say we're in it, we're stuck with it, we'll try next time. To be fair, some of them have started to say, well, you know, if, if it's not going to work, I'm I'm not going to play the game. Or Caddy Piola, for instance, didn't go in for the last classification round, having failed on the two previous ones because they didn't think anything had changed. True, they made one or two rude remarks about the classification system, but they stayed out of it and didn't complain afterwards. And I think that is a better, that is, would be a better system. I couldn't agree more. But equally, I can well see why Corbin Michot, for instance, which in the situation I've described, having uh, won the Coupe de Grand Cru Classe in that year, beaten Canon Lagafelière was then demoted, probably because it didn't have anybody, it missed out by a tiny amount, but didn't have anybody to take people round. I can understand why people, in a sense, if quality of wine is no longer preeminent, that's when I think you get the risk. Because I think people are prepared to accept that there may be differences about how you evaluate wine. No wine grower, could possibly disagree with that. And he may well say to himself, well, that's the luck of the game this time. Next time with a different panel, I may do better. But when other criteria come in that aren't necessarily related to the quality of the wine, I think that introduces a problem as well. But yes, I agree. If I wish they would all bind themselves to accept the results without litigation. Okay, thank you. I think we've got one last one time for just one last question from Dominic. Over to you, Dominic. Thank you, Andrea. Yeah, just, I, I hesitate to wade in as yet another lawyer in this conversation where we are generally saying the lawyers have a lot to answer for. Um, <laughs> and certainly, you know, I can't uh, disagree well, no, with my learned that, friend. It's uh, the clients who decide to go to the lawyer. Of course, uh, as the a lawyer, lawyer we, we're only there to serve our clients, of course, quite, we can say quite. that. <laughs> but, you know, it, it does give us something to talk about. And whilst it's, you know, rather unsavoury that it brings the whole system, you know, down to that of something of a circus. Um, to, to me, I just wonder, Tim, whether you would agree with this proposition that the, the problem and the confusion, I mean, appellations and classifications are slightly different things, okay? We all know that, but consumers probably get a bit confused by this. But what they should be bringing is clarity and definition and differentiation of what they mean. And I, I think you touched on it earlier when you referred to the Santomenio appellation for Grand Cru, because when you've got a Grand Cru appellation and then a Grand Cru classic classification, how is the consumer expected to, to unravel this? And, and I think the, you know, to, to me, the, the, the classification brings 
a certain amount of clarity and help and signposting if you want to trade up to the top minds. But it's the appellation that then brings it all down again and adds confusion. Um, do well, you think that's that's more you know, got more to answer for there? And the satellites as well, of course. Well, the, the satellites. I mean, the satellites are in a sense part of the part of the his, part of the history. I suspect if you were redrawing the bound, if you were drawing Appalachian, Appalachian boundaries now, you, some of the satellites would be included, and some of the land down towards the river would not. Um, but that, of course, would be to ignore oof, a thousand years of history very near, um, which would be a shame in many ways, I think. Um, but not going to happen, I hope. Uh, but the Grand Cru is is it. Grand Cru has been criticised, the use of Grand Cru in Santomino has been criticised often and frequently. Uh, it's actually a, a fair distinction, I think, though it might have been differently named. But anybody who knows Santomino knows that that is the case, that it, Grand Cru does not mean there what it may do in Burgundy, may do in Champagne, may do in Alsace, but equally, it has to be remembered that even there, where Grand Cru is linked to the terroir entirely, you can have a bad winemaker who makes some pretty bad Grand Cru. I once got, had a, bought a bottle of Grand Cru champagne, which I'm afraid ended up being used as drain cleaner. It was so dreadful. Um, and there is at least a tasting criterion for Grand Cru still, and it looks for capacity to age. So it does mark it out as having been, um, as being above the level of, of the Orden, of the Appellation Ordinaire, Appellation Contrôle saint million which is, um, but again, it's not, none of these are hard and fast classifications. I mean, Chateau Coutet could probably hold its own, certainly in my view, with, with many of the Grand Cru classes. I can think of some, some ordinary saint uh, which are made outside the jurisdiction, with grapes grown in the jurisdiction, and therefore cannot be Grand Cru, but which are as good as Grand Cru. I could think of the, some Grand Cru's which probably deserve to be Grand Cru Classe, uh, but don't bother. Some Grand Cru Classe, which you might expect to be Premier Grand Cru Classe as well. So the system's not perfect, but Grand Cru is a bit of an anomaly. But I think it's less of an anomaly than is sometimes thought, because there is, as I say, a tasting criterion for it. Uh, there are those who would like to see um, the reintroduction, reintroduction of the use of the seal of the Girard in the same way, for instance, as there is Testavinage in Burgundy or the Sigil de Saint Etienne in, in, in Alsace or the, uh, uh, the Grumelage in Beaujolais, where, where Grumelage in Beaujolais, where, where the the local people themselves pick out on a blind tasting those wines which are especially good in their category. And I think that would do no harm, certainly, and would, would help, I think, saint -Emilion. But equally introducing another level of, uh, another area for conflict is probably not going to be politically possible or another area for potential conflict. Um, Good as I think it would be to revert to the use of the seal in the way, in the way that uh, was done for so many years. So we've gone full circle <laughs> to where we started. But uh, I, I, I don't know. It's a, it's it's a difficult one. That that one is. I think it's the term Grand Cru. I think that is is open to 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 your concern. But equally, as I say, that can be. That doesn't necessarily mean what it should elsewhere either. Thank you, Tim. <laughs> I think uh, 
yeah we've um... defending my defending my my we're going back to my proper role as chancellor <laughs> absolutely <laughs> yes well, Tim, thank you very much on behalf of all of us for having taken the time and sharing your knowledge. I think we're all far more knowledgeable or far more confused about the issue. Okay. Now. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you again. It's been really very, very interesting. Thank you.